most onboarding programs today are horrific. I mean, they're terrible. Right. You know, they put a young graduate in a in a room where they give them, you know, five stacks of manuals and say, take the next two weeks and read these things. They're, they're not building any vision, sense of purpose, what their identity is going to be. And there's also an expectation reality gap. People come into organizations with expectations because they've been sold a bill of goods. You're going to have this role and this is how we work and you're going to be charged with this. Well, they hit the cold face reality of getting into the workplace and that's not the way it works. Today's episode of the HR l and podcast is sponsored by Deal. Now take a moment, if you would, to consider the following pre-show scenario. Imagine you had to visit 16 houses just to cook your dinner. One place has the pots, another has the pans, another has the stove, and another has the food. You get the idea. Sounds ridiculous, right? Well, the reality is most global businesses operate exactly the same way, using 16 different tools and platforms to hire, manage, and pay their workforce. But now there's one platform that does it all, and that's today's sponsor. That's Deal. That's D-E-E-L. And Deal is the all-in-one platform built for global work. So whether you're an enterprise business, a small company, or something in between, from automated onboarding to performance assessments and beyond, you can manage the entire worker lifecycle all under one roof. Hire and onboard talent in over 150 countries or run payroll in over 100 countries even offer competitive benefits, equity, and equipment. With Deal's industry-leading suite of HR tools, payroll solutions, and compliance services, you can scale globally with unmatched speed and expertise. So are you ready to transform your global HR system? If you are, click in the link in the show notes to book a demo with Deal today. That's D-E-E-L. Welcome to the HR l and podcast, where we explore cutting-edge HR trends and best practices with top leaders who are shaping the future of work. Hello, and welcome back to the HR l and podcast. My name is Nick Day, CEO at JGA Recruitment Group, and we are specialist global HR recruiters. Now, today I have the privilege of hosting Brent Kadersky, a seasoned HR professional with over 30 years or 35 years of expertise in the field of human performance engineering, and he's where he's been driving organizational transformations across major businesses. In fact, his illustrious career has been marked by pioneering milestones in human performance across government and industry sectors, particularly in enhancing US military aircraft platforms. In fact, from 87 to 99, Brent was at the forefront of major human performance trends, leaving an inedible mark on numerous prominent agencies and industries. But in the 21st century, Brent continued to drive significant transformations particularly within Shell, where he led initiatives such as the globalized HR function and ventures focused on HR data quality, business intelligence, learning strategy, and innovation. Well, he's now Chief Learning Officer at Human Works, where he's responsible for owning strategy to improve the human performance experience. And this work involves digitizing and connecting data autonomously and holistically so that futuristic work environments, which are fast approaching, will be human-centered. And that's going to be very much the topic of today's conversation, talking about human-centered solutions and, of course, bridging the employee experience debt gap as well. So without further ado, Brent, welcome to the HR l and podcast. How are you feeling today? I'm doing great, Nick, and thanks for that humbling introduction. Well done. I really appreciate that. That was great. I think I could have made it much longer. You've achieved way more than that introduction probably suggested, but I think we're going to get the the information out of today's conversation, so I'll leave people wanting more. Before we jump into the content, though, Brent, the first question I ask all of my guests is this. What do the words human resources mean to you? Well, you know, that's been a long debated and stimulated question. So, you know, again, I'll talk about this probably a little bit later on. We'll get into it. But if you think about the history of industry. You know, we started, and let's just say the last 100, 100 years, from 1920 to, to, to 2020, you know, we started with the utility era where people were tools, you know, like Frederick Taylor and Taylorism said, hey, I can make a shovel that a person can shovel better. So it was all about connecting a person as a tool to another tool, okay? And then what happened later on is with Fordism or Henry Ford invented the um, assembly line in 1913, really didn't get started until about 1924 when they made a Model T available for the public consumption at about $265. So everybody could do it. And that was the idea of mass production. Um, Now, at that point, people were really um, 
still dehumanized. The um, um, human um, agency was minimized. They wanted a person standing in front of assembly line, and all they were was a simple hire, simple fire, and they were very interchangeable, just like interchangeable parts. And then it wasn't until probably the 30s or so when they started to do the things like the Hawthorne study, and they identified and said, hey, you know, there's beyond the physical aspect of humans, there's a motivational or an intellect aspect of humans, and there's things that motivate them to work. So that institutionalized this whole area of studying kind of the human condition. It really didn't take off very much at all uh, for several decades. So um, what happened in this humanistic era, they was just doing a lot of research. And so Fordism went on from probably the, the 30s to the 70s. And then that's when the next era, what's called post-Fordism, um, came into play. And that went on um, till about 1990-something when McKenzie did their study about the war for talent. And that started to uh, put in people's mind that, hey, we got to fight for the people that we want to come into the door. Well, they did that, and this McKenzie article really um, stimulated that. But what companies did is they said, look how pretty our company is. Come, come in, come in. You're going to love it. Well, people came in, but they didn't love it. So that initiated this whole human experience cycle where people were really critical assets, and you just don't want to get them in the door. You want to keep them in the doors. And so that it kind of evolved all these generations of uh, how we've come to. So from a human resource perspective, um, it's really gotten a little bit different in the last decade or so. You've heard the term power skills. And the power skills came about because companies, whether it's Taylorism, Fordism, post-Fordism, they wanted people to come in, do the skills that they want, have the knowledge they want, and that was it. Well, I institute a, a system called whole person competence development, which people are really comprised of much more than just the company's skills and knowledge. That's the that's really the 80 percent that companies want to deliver 20 percent of the value. The 20 percent that delivers 80 percent of the value of the human being, the human resource are not just their skills and knowledge, but their motives, their traits, their self-image their social role and, and things like that. So companies are treating people like a whole person. And this is why people are disengaged. This is why you have these attrition rates because people are basically still, uh, still considered cogs and they feel like cogs. They don't have a clear sense of purpose and identity. They don't have that sense of agency or what I call autonomy at work to make their own decisions, to not be, you know, um, double checked and you know overseen and all those kind of things so, so it's really about the human resources really taking and putting the human in the resource because these power skills things like higher order cognition because again as we automate and again right now in the world of work we're eliminating the dull dirty right. drudgery dangerous difficult physically you know work and we're replacing it because now humans in, in light of their cognition, they have to not only work with more complex arrays of data and inputs and sensors and all this kind of sense-making kind of things they've got to do. So they've got to be able to sense-make. Now, because of matrix organizations, they not only look at their silo, but they have to look across this interconnected workplace. And that's why this whole connected worker theme has been going on and on and on. So I can look at a a process unit in an oil company, and I can say, well, we've got 15 hydrocrackers across the globe. In 1970, the process operator, the control room operator, just looked at you know his or her little unit. Well, now they can do a shift change where they used to do it on pieces of paper. You know, they'd have paper coming up, and they'd sit and talk about, well, what happened in your shift? What did you do? How did you respond? Okay, what do we think we got to do with the temperature moving forward in the next 10 hours? Now that's digitized. So everybody can see it. And if that hydrocracker person at Deer Park in Texas wants to know what all other 15 hydrocracker units did that evening or that 
prior day, they can look and see. So the human person from a level of cognition and problem solving and decision making and interpretation and sense making, it's quite different than the, the person that sat in Taylorism or Fordism, right? Um, because they were dehumanizing the work. They wanted people that were interchangeable. They didn't, they wanted to de-skill people. And what's the word we use now? We don't use de-skilling, which Fordism used. We use the term called reskilling. So all these people have to learn how to do all the four functions of work better, the sense making, the analysis, the problem solving, troubleshooting, decision making, and most importantly in today's economy, the escalation, knowing when to escalate something and when not to. So I think that, you know, to just go back to your question, the human resource, it's all about the human condition now. And if you think about human condition, there's four things that make people people. And you can talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and all those things, but you and me and everybody in your audience has these four things in common. They're all fallible. Everybody's gonna make mistakes if you're human. It's just, it's, it's part of the human condition. But the good news is they're adaptable. So they can choose to change. They can choose to get better. They can choose their behaviors. They can choose their actions. And the next thing is they're social. They don't want to work in a vacuum. They need a social mirror, social proofing to um, recognize how they're doing in comparison to the world around them, to the, you know, the society around them. And the last thing is they all seek purpose. Without purpose, people flounder. If you think about Viktor Frankl and things like that, what was the human condition? He had a purpose and that's what all humans want. So again, I think companies and leaders have to recognize that you're just not hiring someone for skills and knowledge. You're hiring them for the human elements that they bring into the, the workforce, those, those distinctive power skills. Um, and just, I, I want to pause, but before I do that, the example that I would give you is I did a lot of competence management at Shell. Yeah. And most people in Shell really, they kind of, at the era that I was in, Shell really tried to make people very similar. They, you know, they recruited people from the similar schools early on. It was Cambridge and Oxford is very intellectual. So they had a real sense of, um, you know, admitting you didn't know something was a bad thing. So or knowledge sharing was a bad thing. It wasn't and the whole psychological safety that we have today or what they were trying to get to. So what you saw in that era was they were creating leaders to be replicas of other leaders. So, you know, if you're a leader at Shell, you look A, B, C, D, you look these ways. OK, um, and so, but today we want distinctiveness. So what this idea of distinctive competency is, is I can have two well engineers. They both are the same age. They both went to the same school. They both got the same grades. Um, they both had all the same internships and all those things. They came into Shell or BP or X1. They got all the same training, but one of them, I want to work with all the time. The other one, I run away when I see that person. And it's because of the, the non-skill and knowledge, it's the behaviors, it's the motivations, it's how, how the relationship with that person makes me feel about myself. So when I use them as an SME, for example, are they helpful? Do they not make me feel like an idiot? Do they, you know, are they motivating me to ask deeper, wiser questions? So that's the thing that we've got to get in the human condition today, because you're going to see people are hiring for those non-skill and knowledge areas because companies are going to realize I can't, it's hard for me to develop motivation, you know, intrinsic motivation, what people are really turned on to. It's really hard for me to um, build what somebody's self-image is or what they have as a social role. Um, so you want to hire for those things because it's easier to train skill and knowledge. And we'll talk about maybe later on in, in learning because learning is a quite simple thing to do. It's all of the human elements of learning that are the difficult things. Wow, <laughs> what a great response. I mean, so much to unpick there. I love the fact you started with the war for talent, right? This is something that obviously is right within my wheelhouse, the world of recruitment. And they say if you, it's become somewhat, somewhat of a cliche now, right? But they often say, if you hear a cliche, we should listen to it. There's something in that. And that war of talent's continued no matter what era of time you're looking at. But what's interesting is we go through those different times uh, in history of how the workforce has changed and how the, the, the future of work in, any, in every given time frame has also changed is also the way that we work with our employees. So the, there's been a power shift, particularly in the last five to 10 years, right? Where, well, certainly from my perspective, employees now have much more power than they would have had if you go back to the Ford era, 
people worked <laughs> and would, kind of did what they were told to do. And it wasn't so much revolt as much as you'd see certainly in today's uh, modern work context where people can vote with their feet. If they're not happy, they can move. Um, I love the idea that you talked about having purpose as being one of those four things. That's why people like Simon Sinek have come right to the fore with the, the power of why. And you, you mentioned uh, one of my favorite uh, authors, uh, Victor Frankl, who, you know, I think he quotes Nietzsche in the book, which says he who has a, lived, uh, a why to live by can bear almost any how. And that's important in, in what is the challenging pressure cooker environment of the modern world of work, right? It is more challenging. We're doing more hours than ever we've ever done before. We have to, we're more connected than ever before. It's very hard to switch off. We have to embrace rapid advances in technology. With all that going on, with the HR leaders that listen to this show, who do want to create a more human-centered business organization framework, if you want, that will really help people to perform at their best, to have that feeling of belonging. Because as you say, it was quickly discovered that it's all well and good having an EVP that attracts your staff, but if you don't onboard them and look after them, you can't retain those staff. And not retaining staff right. from high attrition is very, very expensive. So for an HR leader listening to this now, what's the next stage? What's the next phase? What are the things they need to consider to make sure they're able to really dive deep into that thing that makes people feel connected at work? Right. So, you know, there's a lot of data out there. And I study a lot of data there. I do a lot of research. I mean, even if you take the first idea, you know, the first touch point is the onboarding process. Most onboarding programs today are horrific i mean they're terrible Great. you know they put a young graduate in a in a room or they give them you know five stacks of manuals and say take the next two weeks and read these things they're, they're not building any vision sense of purpose what their identity is going to be and there's also an expectation reality gap and this is something that i really talk about a lot is People come into organizations with expectations because they've been sold a bill of goods. You're going to have this role and this is how we work and you're going to be charged with this. Well, they hit the cold face reality of getting into the workplace and that's not the way it works. Um, you know, I know, again, I'll use another shell example. I did a lot of executive leadership coaching and there were studies done, even um, conference board reports um, on Shell, for example, of, you know, the, the success rate of a high level executive coming into Shell and lasting more than three years was um, 33%. And it was because once they got in the organization, there was an expectation reality gap between what they were sold and told they were going to do work at this right. level. And they get in the organization, then they're constrained. You know, they might have been a big VP at some other organization at a wide breadth and depth of scope. They come in the shower organization or BP or whatever, and they're reduced down to a director level in terms of what they did 10 years ago. Then there's a the whole idea of, well, when you're that high level, you're hiring somebody as a, a high level, you know, VP job grade. And all the all their peers in Shell have been there 30 years. And they're saying, why didn't they hire me? Well, I'm not going to help that person out. You know, I'm going to hold knowledge and I'm going to, you know, not really help them out. And the third thing is they don't have the network that somebody at Shell's had for or BP that's, that's generated for 30, 40 years. So they're coming in. They don't know how it works. And so they get really frustrated. And, you know, those four things are, you know, they really um, impact. So one, leaders have to understand what brings people in, what their expectations are, and do they satisfy those expectations or do they offer what I call an expectation depth gap, which means I came in here, I thought, you know, we owed each other something, we had a mutual agreement and I'm delivering as I understood I was supposed to deliver, but you're not. So if you think about the employee experience cycle, okay, there's a couple of elements. So people come in um, with expectations. They say, this is what I think I'm going to be doing. And this comes in at the org level and at the task level. And so, I, you know, the anatomy of work is what I call about, you know, task and jobs and processes and procedures and decisions and delays and, and you know, bottlenecks and all the, all the ugliness of work. You know, I can't get my data. You know, I come to do a task and half the people aren't here today or this guy's not working or she's not doing this. So they have expectations at the org level and then at the work level level. Then they have the actual experience. So, okay, they get in there and can they do the task? I thought I could do it, but no, I can't. Am I going to have autonomy? No, I thought I did, but no, I'm not. Um, and it's all about being, you know, the satisf satisfaction of their well-being while they're in the moment, in the moment. Do they get in the moment? Do they get flow? 
Um, you know, again, you know, the statistics show that, you know, most people are interrupted every 17 minutes or something like that, which is part of the reason why we only get four hours of productivity of, out of people a day. So then they have this in-moment adaption. So and, and in this space, people are, are, are forming their perceptions, their attitudes, and their memory about not only the job task, their experience at doing work, but also the wider organization. Well, okay, we do an employee survey annually. Well, we're bureaucratic. We make slow decisions. We you know, do all these things. So these things are all connected. And a lot of executives don't, don't get that. They're hoping that all the people underneath them will, will take care of that. Then people go to the water cooler and they reflect. Oh, you did see that new engagement survey. Oh, you know, I did my task today and it was lousy. And they complain. And it's a negative way. But if companies were positive, I'm a big advocate of like every day, you know, people, should, the company should have like an app. Like, how was your work day? Were decisions made? Instead of this once a year annual survey, no, do it every day. And, and an employee gets $2 a day for doing it or something like that. It's a lot cheaper than a, have an external consulting firm do a big, uh, you know, annual survey. Um, you know, did you, you know, were there untimely delays? Was there was a great collaboration? Was innovation prompted, you know, were we offered to fail fast? Were you psychologically safe? You know, do all those things and get a real pulse on a day-to-day -day basis or every other day or once a week or however you want to sample it. So get a better job of reflecting on people's work, you know, do it for real. Because with digital capabilities today, there's no reason not to do this dynamic data collection. Right. And the next thing they do is they go home or they, they prepare to go back to work or they prepare to do that task again or a new task. And they form these expectations and they say, huh, another one of these or, oh, we're going to do this again. And, you know, that my experience in this company when we try to do this is that. And so it's this whole anatomy of, of culture and anatomy of work that organizations really need to be cognizant about. And, and again, I don't think they are because. The companies that I work with, most of the time, they rely on, on on best intended efforts and gifted amateurs to do a lot of their HR kind of stuff. Because most people think HR and learning, anybody can do that. We're going to bring in all the operators to be learning people, you know, but they don't understand the science, the neurology of learning, the neuroscience, you know, they don't understand classical learning and, and um, you know, what it really takes to do learning well. And you only really see truly good learning development most often, you know, in the military, uh, nuclear, medical, where, you know, it's over life and death situations. And I wish that companies would quit pulling in operational people to be learning people or, you know, HR people that are journeymen. They're in recruitment one year, they're in payroll the next, they're you know, all these things. There's a real lack of, of, of companies understanding the, the distinctive expertise. It's just like um, human-centric design. Like in these connected worker systems, there's really 12 principles of human-centric design. Most companies do like two or three. They'll do like personas, but they still don't even do personas that well. They like do a surface level persona and they might do like uh, tryouts, like pilots and proof of concepts, but they don't oftentimes do those well in a real um, scientific way to, you know, collect data and interpret it. So, you know, it, this is the kind of things we're doing. We're, we're kind of gifted amateurs are at work oftentimes in these specialty areas like learning and, you know, those kind of things or work design you know, they just don't have the capabilities to, to really yeah, do that. Well. And I'm not saying they're not smart, great people because you hired them. But, sure. you know, it seems like HR and learning is the one discipline in the in the function that anybody can kind of get pushed into it where you wouldn't do that with a well engineer. I mean, there's a lot of uh, plates there spinning, right? So I can understand your, your, your idea there where you can easily become a jack of all trades, but a master, a master of none. And you mentioned the military. I mean, interestingly, I discovered only last week um, that the, the term soft skills and Hard skills came, came from out of the military. military. Right? The ability to use a, a weapon would be a hard skill. And, and I, I thought right. that was really interesting. But I think you, you you talk about an interesting point, which is all that investment goes into the attraction of staff. And we hit the onboarding process. And a lot of people go, well, that's no longer my responsibility. And yet the costs of getting a poor hire in, I know as a recruitment firm, right? It's cost to find someone. It's costly in time. It's costly in financial resource. It's costly in training and development. But if we get that wrong, and either we lose top talent that's already with our business, maybe after three years, as you mentioned, 
that's really expensive to replace. But also, even if you just go through that whole process, find a new member of staff, and they leave you in that onboarding process, sometimes we need to look up and go, why have they left? And really explore whether we've done enough to make sure that that experience, that expectation gap that you mentioned earlier on is mitigated and understood and that that, that clarification of understanding is in place. So with, with that in mind, the things you're talking about there, you mentioned how a lot of people get the learning side of the, on, the onboarding process or even the ongoing um, career development process wrong, or they don't invest heavily enough in it, or they don't understand it. So from your perspective, what does good learning look like? What are the things you mentioned 12 principles, you covered a couple of them there. What are the other principles people need to consider and how can we start to get that right? Right. So if you think about formal learning, I mean, you can go back and, and I'll just take an American perspective. If you think about the Revolutionary War when, um, you know, George Washington brought in the Prussian general von Strobin uh, to train the, you know, the revolutionary soldiers at Valley Forge. They basically it was drill and practice. It was, you know, from a manual, this is how you do it. Even then when you went to the Civil War, same kind of thing, drill and practice. Drill, even, you know, Spanish-American War, World War One, and World War Two. In World War II, um, they asked, the, the military asked some scientists to come and say, is there a better way to train people? And so they started to do more structured training to train people in a similar way at large scale, right? Um, but then on my birthday... In 1965, uh, Robert Gagné introduced that year actual instructional systems development and the whole idea of like the five outcomes of learning, like verbal information, intellectual skills, physical skills, behavioral skills, you know, attitude, attitudes uh, based skills and all those kind of things. Um, and the nine in, nine events of instruction that was Gagné's bit. And actually, it was I was very honored to my uh, master's um, teacher was Gagne's um, um, graduate student. So I got a, got a good taste of all that from her. Um, but anyways, um, they need to understand these basic things. And it's funny because I think the, the science of learning is so simple. You've really got three things. You've got knowledge, you know, factual knowledge, declarative knowledge, procedural knowledge, and you've got skills. And then you have behaviors and attitudes or whatever. If you take knowledge, knowledge is very simple. In this age of digitization, every company should have what I call a content component management system. And it should take all their knowledge. And this is the next generation of knowledge management. So knowledge is comprised of, of about seven things. Facts, concepts, theories, principles, processes, procedures, and structures. From an instructional perspective there's a way to teach all those things from a science perspective like a concept you give a, an example then you show uh, or you give a the, the definition then you show an example then you show a non-example and then you give them time to practice you know so what i would do and what i'm advising all these the clients and everybody that i can talk to you have this thing called the forgetting curve and it's taken us two generations to understand that if you tell somebody something within 90 minutes, they're going to forget yeah. 90, 90 percent of it. So recognize that we got digital systems that give you just in time knowledge curated and rendered any way you want it to be individualized. Right. So take all that knowledge, put it in a CCMS, which is beautiful about the CC is it's it's content component which makes i can take a, a a statement or anything and i can tag it i can index it so from an ai perspective and this is what ceos aren't understanding if you don't start curating collecting curating and rendering your content now when the ai explosion really goes on you're gonna have nothing to give ai systems to do so they've got to do all the knowledge and put that away and the next thing is in the skill department skills are really simple you have the can I do this skill? Can I apply the skill? So that's one way to train people. And it might be real time, you know, physical training with the actual equipment or something, but it might be simulation if it's high risk and, you know, scarce uh, to find and all those things. And you put the best way to train those things that way. And then the same thing with, um, um, you know, the they do three things with skills. They apply it. They can analyze the skill so they can troubleshoot, problem solve, make decisions, and they can evaluate it so that they can coach, they can judge, they can improve, they can interpret, you know, they can they can build it better. Um, so learning is not that hard. I mean, it's those kind of things.
the behavior. I mean, most companies don't do anything in terms of behavioral skill building. I mean, you know, uh, and like things like behavior modeling and all those yeah. things, giving people, you know, if people are really going to even even like in decision making. Companies should have like the standard decision cycles that they train, standard problem solving cycles so they can coach people say, well, you didn't do step five of the decision cycle. Well, how could you have done that better next time? So you coach them. And then, like I said, with the behaviors and attitudes. There's a there's a, a pyramid that you have to go to get somebody to behave different. You got to first like get them to listen, you know. Then you got to get them to um, engage. Then you got to get them to actually believe it. Then you got to get them to value it. Then you got to get them to like embrace it. And then you got to get them to choose to do it. And then you got to get them to like champion it. Well, most companies don't understand that, and they just go to level one. I'm going to show you a PowerPoint slide and. I'm going level to one is often is often the tick box, right? They say it's done. I've told them. Now it's over to them. No longer my responsibility. We move on. And it's that it's that understanding that telling someone, as you said, we have that that forgetting curve, right? Telling someone something doesn't mean it's going to happen to the way you want it done. And we also know you mentioned coaching. I'm a huge fan of developing coaching cultures. We know that telling someone to do thing actually isn't the way to get someone to do something right. You want them to right. want to do the work. Um, right. You want them to understand why they're doing the work. You mentioned Frankel earlier and the, the power of why, not just doing it because I've been told, because we're no longer in working in an environment, as you mentioned forward earlier, that's so almost dictatorial from the top, where it said you do it this way because I've told you to. People want to know why they're doing the work. They want to know how right. they're adding value to that organization, how they fit into the bigger picture and all the things that go with it. You've talked a lot today about um, the expectation gap, which I love. Not, not a term I've heard before. And I, I, mm -hmm. I totally understand that that's a problem in that early phase, particularly when you're attracting stuff. Mm -hmm. I, also, I also think there's a real experience debt gap as well at the moment. I know that a lot of companies are trying to introduce connected worker designs and, and different things that are trying to, I uh, guess, overcome that gap. But you've got a lot of experience in that field. So I wonder if you've got any examples of particular connected designs that have really genuinely and measurably successfully improve the employee experience gap for those kind of organizations. Right. Well, and this will lead in, and I'm going to get to the point. I'm going to kind of drizzle in. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about mental health because that's where it starts. Sure. Today's environment Critical. is all about well-being. Now, again, I talked about the whole person before. Companies don't treat people as whole persons. They, you know, either check your brain at the door sometimes, which was really uh, more evident in my generation, um, to, you know, engagement when we try to engage people, but now it's experience. So we went from the era of engagement, participative management, quality circles, all those kinds of things. And now we're into this um, uh, experience, but we've only done it from an HR level of how was your employment cycle, not your work cycle. And so they have to bring it down to cover not only the broad, the T, the top of the T, but the depth of the experience in the company, the actual day to day things. Um, and I want to just go to two more things because you mentioned coaching and leadership. I'm a yeah. huge advocate of professionalizing leadership, you know. The number one reason people leave companies is the lack of affiliation with their leader, right? right? And a lot of companies, and I don't want to pick on Shell, but you know, technical companies, especially like Shell or BP, they take the best performing technical person and promote them up to be a leader. Terrible, 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 Agreed. terrible. Agreed. That happens um, in all industries, sales industries. Right. It happens in top salesperson yeah. becomes the manager, right? And it's typically the ones that are the best doers aren't the best leaders because right. they're the ones that are distinctive in how they do it. And they're typically loners and they typically want to just drill in and they're, they have a different passion set. And that passion set is that high level of achievement, not it's their achievement, not the achievement of others. So I really believe that there's going to be, we're going to see a shift in HR that there's going to be a new discipline and a new professional called leadership. And you're going to see people studying at universities how to actually just be a leader. Non-technical skills, and I know the, the, the businesses will push back, so you can't have a non-technical person be a leader. No, that's exactly what we want. We want that unbiased person to be leading people and engaging people. Same thing with coaching. To make leaders or supervisors that are lousy supervisors and coaches, to, to then saddle them on top of that to be coaches of people or mentors 
it doesn't work because it's not in their interest all the time because they already disregarded three people because they're the worst and these are the best. So they're going to spend time with these ones. I advocate companies should invest for the well-being of people, external coaches. They're unbiased. They're professionally certified. And that way a person can bring in their whole person. I can't go to my supervisor and say, you know, I don't know if I really want to work here anymore. I've got problems at home. You know, I've got my kids are in trouble. I got a bunch of life issues that I can't tell you as my manager because it's going to bias you with me. You know, I've got health issues, maybe or something like that. But I can tell an external coach and they can help me with not only my employment, but my employability. And this is the thing that we're trying to shift to. And leaders have to let go of the fact that living in the old model where they think that the unfair exchange that they can tease people with employment for life, but cut them any time and make people feel like well, you're going to be here forever. But the employee doesn't get to say, I don't know if I want to tease you that I'm going to be here forever. I might want to leave you know, pretty soon too. And you're going to see that churn and you're seeing it already. I mean, most of the companies I work with, their attrition rates right now, it's averaging like 1.7 years, depending on the, you know, pace, yeah. pace segment. Hello, HR and people leaders. Are you exhausted of the war for talent cliche? The problem is when we hear a cliche, it usually exists for a reason. However, we think it's time for a fresh approach to the talent crisis. That's because at JGA Recruitment, we understand the real challenges you face in sourcing phenomenal HR and people candidates. And guess what? We think we have the solution. Our team is on a mission to revolutionize your hiring process. That's because we're not just recruiters. We're strategic partners dedicated to finding HR and people professionals who align perfectly with your company's vision and goals. So let's break the cycle of frustration together. Partner your talent acquisition strategies with JGA Recruitment and experience the difference in service, excellent and results. No longer do you need to suffer the costs associated with a poor hire, because with over 100 five-star Google reviews and already trusted by many of the world's leading brands, why don't you take action today? Contact us at jgarecruitment.com to discover how we can help transform your HR and people teams. And here's a bonus. When you visit us, you can sign up for our weekly HR newsletter that's packed with invaluable industry insights and more. Let's revolutionize your HR talent acquisition strategies together and make the war for talent a cry from the past. Visit jjrecruitment.com to find out more. So anyways, I want to go back to your 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 question. I think so. just, just before you do, there's something that, that resonated with me. I'm a massive sports fan, right? So it doesn't matter what the sport is, basketball, American football, soccer, whatever, right? I love all the sports. Ed Lasso. But it's in one of those industries, I think, that actually does embrace that a little bit more than the actual commercial, you know, professional um, organization. So, for, for example, um, yeah, if you look at soccer, the best footballers with Lion, Lionel Messi at the moment is the world player of the year, um, Ballon d'Or winner eight times. That doesn't mean he's going to be a great manager. And actually, if you look at the people that win the competitions, World Cups in football, Super Bowls, whatever it is you're in, often the, 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 the best managers or coaches never played the sport at the top, top, top level. And I think right. that for me is a good example where just because you could be the greatest footballer in the world, that doesn't automatically make you the greatest manager. But if that's, you know, and people may think that that's the natural progression, but it often isn't. And actually they often fail because the skills that made you a top pro football or whatever are a totally different set of skills that are required right. to be right. a top manager. I mean, it's the whole thing, you know, the skills that got you here won't get you there. Right. And and we don't follow that rule of thumb. And it's just like I would much rather say, and why are we spending all this time and energy putting leadership training into our current employees? Why wouldn't we say, you know what, I've got a whole discipline of leaders and I can plug them anywhere in the organization because they're certified super leaders. You manage their performance. If they're not a great leader based on you know analytics and things, then you move them out. But we should have professional, certified, you know, people that love to lead, are great at it, instead of it being a byproduct of their day job. How hard is it then to make that? So we talked about the experience debt um, a moment ago and sort of overcoming that experience debt gap. How do you do that for a leader that is moving into a sex they've never done? I'll give an example. I'll, I'll make a creative example. We've got Ted Lasso, a show we love over here, <laughs> right? 
great show, but he he made his name in, in a fictional series, I think, in American football, moved over to soccer. And actually, yes, for a lot of that show, his leadership, his people management skills eventually shine through. But he had to adjust to a totally different sport he knew nothing about. How easy is it for a certified leader who has all those management skills to move into an industry to lead a group of people that they have very little experience of? Is that a, is that an easy change? So, yeah, what I would go back to is the big the big fingers of of the anatomy of work. So I would say let's let's say in uh, geology. Let's say I'm going to be I'm going to hire you as a leader for my geology division. Okay, so you go in and you look and you say, well, how are decisions effectively made in the geology field? You know, where are the trade-offs? What are the biases typically? What are the un unconscious biases? What are the organizational politics and all this kind of stuff? What are the people-related things that impact? Um, and then how do you analyze? What, how is the am, data analyzed? Best? And how do you troubleshoot, problem solve? You know, I would ask them the, those demands. Because, again, work is only about those things. Work is about... You know, starting initiation queue, knowing when to start the, the job task, analyzing incoming input or, or sense making existing input, right. troubleshooting, problem solving, decision making, escalation and learning from doing. And, and that's really all that work is. And and again, we get we complicate work so much, but really people should go into jobs and their training program should be how do I do the task? How do I analyze the task? How do I evaluate the task? And then how do I apply that task into the work structure by, you know, again, all those things, when to start it, when to stop it, you know, sense making, all those kind of things. And that's what the, the big things, the big rocks that we should be um, helping people with. Even like this era of knowledge, you know, with these digital systems, I don't want to teach people the granularity of facts and figures and, you know, seven, you know, weeks of training with big, you know, binders or whatever in a, in a, in a learning center somewhere that they're going to forget it all. I want to teach them the fundamental critical thinking skills and then give them the tools to do human performance support. I'll ask a question then, Brent. And uh, you mentioned the military a couple of times. Obviously, it's part of your background as well. But one of the things that works so well in the military is the opportunity to, to develop your career into a more senior role within a business. And that's the same for workers as well. Right? They want to progress. And we know that one of the reasons people, probably the most popular reasons people leave is because they don't like their leader or don't, don't resonate with the leader. But another reason behind that is a lack of career progression. So if we if we are potentially taking out that layer of, managers and leaders for those people and we're focusing only on allowing them to deliver the skills to the most effective and efficient way that they can how do we overcome the gap of progression where do they move to what, what do we do right. in, that, in that instance so so think about it this way um when you're in a company let's say you have a competence framework right and at, at the lowest level you have people that are kind of knowledgeable about that competency which means that they can contribute to others in and getting stuff done. They can't do it independently by themselves. That's one pay level. So everybody that can kind of work at the knowledge level, and that might be people that are in the company zero to five years, right? right. Then at the next level, you've got people that are, are, are competent. You know, so those are people that they are, they're fully capable of doing their job, okay? And so that means that um, they're in the next level of like the pay scale. But within that pay scale, you might have different scales to pace based on the job, you know, the, the accountability in the job, the scope of the job, the responsibility in terms of financial or whatever that might be. Then you go up to the next level that people are that are advanced. They can do a lot of troubleshooting, problem solving. They, they've reached that advanced skill. And then at the highest level, you have people that are deemed experts. So you might want to, if you're a technical, because that's what technical people want. Technical people want to be known as the principal technical expert, right? Um, not necessarily the leader. They want to be the leader because of the pay and the status. But if you change right. the pay and the status structures, you know, and what if you paid leader? What if leaders were paid the nominal range? Maybe the leaders paid what mid metal because it's just a, you know, a, um, a, a particular discipline, you know, but it has the prestige and people are doing what they want to do because people love doing it. You see what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. It would need a, it would need a big transformation across the world of work. I mean, we're talking about the future of work. Maybe that's where it's yeah. going. 
Um, well, but that but but that's the problem is, you know, that's why we, I talk a little about this idea of industrial pluralism, you know, like your educational pluralism, political pluralism. And pluralism just means that, you know, you look in, in it's the advanced level of like DNI, but it's not like the political side of DNI. It's understanding that in a work ecosystem, there's a whole hell of a lot of variables. There's management, there's employees, there's there's culture, there's external. And what you're trying to do is say, not everybody in the organization is the same, okay? So we don't put a pipe because, but in most organizations, they tr the, the organization treats every type of worker, every type the same. This is how we deal. But in tomorrow's environment, you know, like like today, we the American dream, at least here, is you grow up, you get great grades, you go to a fine college, and you're success. Well, you know, the the undergraduate or the 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 K through 12 schools aren't teaching people different pipelines. Say I want to be a trades worker. I don't want to go to college. I don't have the economics. I don't have the, you know, the intellect that, that, that way. But I want to be the best trades person. We don't have channels for that. And companies don't treat people like those different career bands. You know, so if that, and that's why you get the stigmatism. Well, I'm not a leader, so I'm, I'm marginalized. Yeah. So I think that there's going to be a lot more going on with this idea of pluralism from a standpoint of you don't treat everybody the same in an organization because they are on different paths. And this is the whole thing about well-being. Um, you know, look, you look at the statistics. I mean, you know, number one, I think it's something like in the U.S., like 70 plus percent of all primary care visits to their doctors are about stress and work related stress. Right. You know, um, you've got 95 percent of Americans cl claiming chronic work stress, you know, and goes on these terrible, you know, um, work stress in the U.S. is like the fourth leading cause of death because it leads to obesity, cardiovascular disease, drug and alcohol abuse, you know, all those kinds of things. So I think people have to look at the bigger picture of even the availability of workers in the future. I mean, you know, there's a lot of trends saying we're not going to have a hard time filling jobs. And yeah. what we're going to have. We're seeing that. That war for yeah. talent still exists from that McKenzie yeah. Portman years ago. Well, and, 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 and people aren't, you know, people are job jumping today and companies can't retain them and they don't know what to do. They don't know, should we increase pay? Should we create a four day work week? Should we, you know, they're looking for options because, Again, in the manufacturing sector, the annual turnover rate is like 40 to 60%. Yeah. And well, you yes, talk I think about... what, what I'm hearing now is there is no one size fits all approach, though, to employees. Right? That's the thing. That's what makes well, it. Well, that's it. The, the insightful organization is going to go to have the flexibility. The, I mean, remember, right. we, remember, we were in the mass production era, and we went to the mass production era because we wanted everybody to afford a Model T. But again, the limitation was you could only get it in black. Then we went to the post Fordism where we wanted everybody wanted access, but they also wanted more personalization. So you had, you know, instead of having like, you know, Ford having all their parts, materials, tires, everything made in Detroit. Now you had the globalization where you had, OK, we can make this in China. We can make this in Argentina and bring it all together. You know, it's more decentralized so we could, again, lower costs, make it more available and have it make more features. Well, now today we're in this era of experience, but experience is about high concept, high touch solutions. So, again, it's the idea that I always say is, you know, this pen isn't just a pen. It's a flashlight. It's a it's a screwdriver yeah. tool. It's five other things. And that's what workers want. They want the flexibility to like almost like a cafeteria style. You can say, well, I want to have a four day work week and I want to do this. And you're going to have that. You're going to have organizations where they might have the flexibility to be able to absorb intellectually and from a capacity perspective, allowing people to have more choice. Um, so, again, I mean, this we're thinking out here because, I mean, again, you know, I always say these cycles, you know, you know, Thomas Edison invented the light bulb in like 17 or I'm sorry, 18, like 78 or something like that. But it wasn't mainstreamed until like the 1930s. I mean, in 1920, I think, you know, one percent of farms had electricity, you know, and that was 40 years later. Right. So, I mean, this stuff takes a generation. Yeah, right. I, I do know is all the things you mentioned there help 
harness a sense of belonging. And whether you're talking about DEI initiatives and inclusion, whatever, if we feel like we belong, we're going to retain those. In, right. We're going to stay with that business because that's, yeah. what, you know, human nature. We go back to the human centric piece. We like to feel like we belong in a tribe, right. a community, a, right. you know, whatever that is. And if we don't, we feel uncomfortable, stress levels, you know, rise we, we, and it manifests in different ways, right. whether we leave or whatever. Yeah. And if you think about it, I mean, I had a manager one time, um, He's a, he's a VP, but I was working out of DC. I was remote. He goes, You got a hell of a career, but it's not in DC. It's here. You got to move here. And, you know, you think about like women in the workforce. I mean, they're rising up, they're, they're, they're becoming the majority of the workforce. And we are not um, being flexible enough. What do I care? I want talent. I don't care to bind that talent in a cubicle in Houston, you know, on this team. If you want, if you, if leaders really want the best talent, they'll make adaptive systems to enable that talent to bring themselves into the table. I mean, you know, and again, we still have these rigid ideas around physical workspaces and nine to five and all those kinds of things, which if you really want to treat human resources as human and not a piece of equipment that needs to be running as a photocopy machine in the office for nine hours, you got to be more adaptive. Yeah, I love that. Well, listen, I, th I think we've we've kind of almost gone full circle, but I think what I'd like to do, and it's been a quite conceptual episode, with lots for people to digest, reflect, and and, and analyze as well. In, in, um, once they've gone through this, I'd, I'd probably recommend listening to it a couple of times. But in the immediate future, my last question really is this: If we look into the future, what are the immediate trends that you foresee seeing start to proliferate the the, the HR space, particularly in related to connecting workers to employers? What are the things that you're seeing in the future of work that actually fast forward, maybe just 12 months, because technology is, is rapidly evolving, right? Well, what, what can we start to expect to experience in the world of work? Yeah. Well, again, you know, I always say that, you know, companies, people, leaders will, you know, ex exchange the hard choice of tomorrow for the simple choice today. Yeah. And unfortunately, we've got to get companies to think longer term and they're thinking about their profitability, their share price, you know, all those kind of things. And, you know, I, I think in the connected worker space and even like companies today, they're not implementing connected worker solutions at the pace that they want because they don't they don't they haven't changed their structure. They're still living in the 1990s when we did business process reengineering, where it was very simple. You'd get a team together, you know, twice a week, maybe for two hours to flow, flow chart things. And, you know, somebody would facilitate that and you'd reengineer a system or you did a quality circle. But with these connected worker systems, you can't just take people out of their day job, bring them together and say, what do you it's much more complicated and complex. And so companies haven't figured out you need new resourcing models. Okay. And they haven't num So number one, they haven't thought about the new resourcing models. They need to really be successful. And that's quite honestly, one of the reasons why these digital solutions, 70% fail, you know, 70% don't deliver intended value, you know, 70%, you know, um, don't deliver any expectation that they had. So I think people have to understand about, you know, resourcing, I think they have to understand about building and flexibility. And I think they have to understand, you know, they're, they're reactively chasing their solutions and hoping they don't have to make transformational change. Did, like if I went to a company and said, look, you got a real attrition problem. You need to make your workforce more flexible. You need to go to a four day work week. Even though there's lots of companies out there that have proven the four day work week, week's pretty good. People are still, you can't do that. You know, I still remember the manager that would go around walking the office to see how many people were sitting in their office. And if you weren't so sitting I, in your office, you weren't working. So, yeah. I mean, think of those men. I mean, that was only like 15 years ago. I mean, so that so we're still applying that mental model to today. And I mean, you've got all these Gen Z's and Alphas now coming in. They grew up with the Internet. They grew up with social media. They have opinions. It's an entirely different animal that we're dealing with. I mean, and now who thought who would have thought millennials now are the majority of the workforce? You know, I can't I can remember when they were just coming in. So yeah. I mean, the whole complexity, and you've got all the things of you know technical, operational, commercial, 
you know, uh, political, societal. And this, this is why we have this thing called Industry 4 and Industry 5. Industry 5 is the advancement because Industry 4 is all about just technical, cyber physical connectivity. We're going to sensors and drones and big chain and blockchain and all this stuff in analytics. And now they're saying now the future of work is humans working with that established technology to cobot to you know to improve right. their abilities right. so i don't you know, again you know my thing is when i sit with companies you know they're they're not doing the what i see the right thing they're not like blueprinting their competence needs they're not building whole person development of people they're not creating the flexible environments and again i'll start with this last thing We've known for a generation plus now, there's six things that, that drive people to work. It's, have you given them clear performance expectations and feedback? Have you given them proper tools, information, and resources? And have you incentivized doing good work as, 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 as a good thing? Whether, you know, oh, I get all the work because Julie and Sam don't do their share. And then it's about skills and knowledge and that whole person development. And then it's about capacity how do you help a person improve their capacity so they're not burnt out and all those things and the last thing is how do you keep them motivated with purpose we've known those six things for for a decade gartner just did a research study and you know they evaluate a lot of those similar things and the employees and again the expectation reality gap they 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 asked employees and they asked leaders about, you know, feedback or, you know, purpose and work. And in every one of these things, there was a gap. You know, leaders thought they give great feedback and leaders thought the purpose was super clear. And lead and the employees said, no, you, don't, you give lousy feedback. No, I don't have the tools to enable me to have a flexible work life. You know, no, you don't, you know, you, I'm not motivated because I don't understand the purpose and I have no idea how my work contributes to the bigger picture. So, I mean, we know all this stuff. And again, my big thing is why aren't companies acting on it? I mean, it's it's right out there if you look at it. I mean, people are doing the research and we're right. we're swamped with research. So it's interesting. you picked up a couple of coaching concepts in that there. I mean, earlier on you said, Well, got you here, won't get you there. I like the, the idea as well that every time we say yes to these things, it's a different kind of way of looking at things. We say yes to continuing to do things the way we're currently doing them, we're saying no to improvement. We say yes to this, we're saying no to that, right? And I think when you gave the example of that gap there with the surveys, it's because sometimes we get so focused on looking at things only from our perspective that we don't have the opportunity or the, the bandwidth or even the foresight to think, okay, that's how I feel because of the education I had, because of how I grew up, because of how work was 15 years ago, as you mentioned, because of the, the, the social economic climate when I grew up, the political states when I grew up. But that's a totally different beast to the people potential on the other side of the coin right because as you mentioned with the the alpha generation the generation z they've got they've been growing up under different political standpoint different social economic situations so the way they frame the world and see the world is going to be different and we have to try and bridge the gap of seeing things reframing our vision to view things from a slightly different standpoint because as you said earlier what's got us to this point is not going to get us to the next point i like the right. idea there's a there's a philosophy out there 10xing things you don't have to attach yourself to the goal but where do you want to get to in 10 years? And then start that process now. And if you don't get to where you wanted to go, that's fine. But you'll start making the, the cultural shifts, the, the technological shifts that are needed now to get to where you want to go. And you might find you get there a lot quicker. But I think there's right. a real tendency just to do what we did before. And that, yeah. uh, that you know, that, 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 that uh, what's the word? It stagnates performance. And stagnation is something that no, none of us want, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah, it's that whole idea of, you know, incremental, radical improvement. But now, you know, we've got exponential. And that's where it's really a, a force multiplier, which, again, right. I think a lot of companies don't get. And again, you know, just to round it up with, this, with, a, with what I do at, you know, the Hexagon thing, they've got a suite of these connected worker products. And the early generation of all the connected worker products are really about doing the simple things, dull, dirty, dangerous work, you know, working from heights, put a sensor up in the sky, you know, um, you know, put a put a, you know, cameras in here or do, you know, you know, try to get connected data and analytics. But I think what we're seeing now is a lot of the companies, the implementation of these big systems weren't working because the humans were rejecting them. And so the whole point now is you design these systems where the humans see the benefit and they see it as a benefit to their personal growth 
and development and it, how it improves their anatomy of work. So they won't be as frustrated. They will have more agency in what they do and how they do it. It'll bring them more flexibility at work. So they don't have to be nine to five and all those things. So these connected worker ecosystems, they have to play a huge role in enabling companies to, to deliver more flexibility in how work is done, where work is done, and when work is done. Brilliant. So, I mean, for, for, for someone who's listened to this, I mean, you are very much a sought after speaker. You do a lot of keynotes. You're doing a lot of work in this thing. You've been featured on Workforce.com, um, Harvard Business Press, BBC News as well, of course. If someone is listening to this and they want to find out more, they want to engage with yourself, where can I direct them? Uh, the easiest place is just on my LinkedIn profile. Okay, so I'll make sure there's a connection link to your LinkedIn profile in the show notes. Uh, I'll also put a link to the the URL of the business for Hexagon and also you're working for uh, your your, your um, current role as well. So people who want to find out more, I'll put all the URL links in the show notes. Is there anything else that I haven't asked today, Brent, that you want to, your final closing remarks, final closing thoughts for our listeners today? Well, I, I think, you know, I always use the quote, you know, nothing easy is ever good and nothing good is ever easy and you know when i would do a lot of my transformation you know everybody's like an archetype you know you have like the 12 archetypes made by carl jung and you know you have the hero and you know the you know the all, all the 12 of them yeah. and i use this thing called the arc of drama in the world of work and anything we do I and mean, if i go down to the gas station you know i might have a hassle and get frustrated the pump didn't work my credit card didn't work you know drama and then then i saw it and it's fine so you know this you're gonna always have this problem and i think people don't realize when they enter things it's gonna be hard work you know so you're gonna have an antagonist that wants to do something better. I want to change the world. Then you're going to have this protagonist says, no, no, not on my watch or not, you know, or, you know, we've been there, done that before. It won't work here. We're unique. You know, give me 20 reasons why it won't work. And then you're going to have this kind of rising action where you finally kind of hit it, hit issues. Oh, we don't have the bandwidth. Wi-Fi won't work in there. Wi-Fi won't work at the site and all the, the cloud was going to cost us double than the development of the solution. And, you know, we, and I'm going to get in trouble with my leaders and oh no, and I'm going to lose my job. And, you know, then things get sorted out and they have a real rough patch, but then they start to have falling action. And it's just like any play movie script or whatever. And then it's going to get sorted out. And then there's going to be a, a new point B, you know, you went from that point A, I wanted to get somewhere. Now you've done all that hassle and all that drama and now you finally worked it and it works out great. Or you made some really good lessons against a logical opportunity that you foresaw or you wanted to chase. And I think people don't understand that, you know, to do anything good, you know, it takes a lot of tries, you know, Edison, solving polio, whatever that is. I mean, a lot of hard work. I just watched that uh, uh, show on Netflix about the lady that swam across uh, from Cuba to the Florida Keys. You know, she did it like five times before she got it done. Yeah. So, you know, I think this is why we're in the business, you know, and you can't run status quo anymore. I mean, you, you're you just going to lose. So I think you got to have energetic visionary leaders that um, aren't afraid to, you know, um, go against the grain a bit. And there's a lot oh, of God. grain out there today. I love the uh, the acronym FAIL. Uh, if you break it down, it's first attempt in learning, right? Yeah, and that's yeah, the yeah. idea. Yeah, Don't be afraid to fail because that allow, that allows you to progress. And he, Michael Jordan was famously said, you know, he missed more baskets than anyone. Uh, but that's how he managed to get so many as well, right? You've got to keep shooting. The more you shoot, the better you get and the more you're going to make. So uh, listen, Brett uh, Kizerski, it's been an absolute <laughs> pleasure having you on today's show. It's very thought-provoking. Love the the content related to how we can really maximize the, the human condition, maximize human performance within a work context. So thank you ever so much for joining me today on the HR L&D podcast. And of course, if you are an HR leader listening to this show, you want to find out more, I will put uh, Brent's uh, URL for his LinkedIn profile in the show notes. Or if you need support with a recruitment related a vacancy in the HR sphere, then please do get in touch with my team. The link will also be in the show notes to jgarecruitment.com. Well, I always leave me to say a huge thank you once again to Brent Kudzerski for joining me today. I look forward to being the next episode of the HR L&D podcast real soon. Brent, thank you ever so much. Thanks a bunch, Nick.
Today's episode of the HR L&D podcast is sponsored by Deal, the all-in-one global people platform that simplifies how you manage the entire global team lifecycle. From contractors, direct employees, EOR, and more, you can manage them all in one place with Deal. Hire and onboard talent in over 150 countries in minutes, or run payroll in over 100 countries with just one click. Offer competitive benefits, equipment, and equity from a single dashboard. Even customize career roadmaps, performance assessments, and more for your team through Deal's suite of AI-powered learning and development tools. So no matter your global business goals, Deal's team of over 200 legal experts keeps you compliant with local laws every step of the way. So whether you're an enterprise business, a small company, or something in between, Deal is built to meet your unique global HR needs. Ready to transform your global HR? Click the link in the show notes to book a demo with Deal today. That's D-E-E-L. 